John Henry Cole is captain. Boss man, do you ever pray? Well, if I miss this deal, let it humble get away. Mara be your barren day, Lord Lord. Let Mara be your barren day. This is on mass, bringing together stories of struggle and hope from the working class. I'm your host, Liz Medina. You are listening to episode one, titled You're in a Different World, featuring the story of Sarah Miller, who is a diversion case manager for the Washington County Diversion Program, based in Barrie, Vermont. Diversion programs try to divert people away from the criminal justice system and into rehabilitation and other social programs that try to remedy the conditions that led to the offending behavior. These programs are an important step in recognizing that many nonviolent offenses are either public health or societal issues versus simply the actions of bad people. However, what I learned from Sarah's story is that much deeper systemic change is needed. Sarah's hometown is Akron, Ohio. Like Barry, Akron experienced deindustrialization and economic decline over the second half of the 20th century. But Akron has gotten better, she told me. Barry is still struggling. The people that come into her office are faced with some of the worst effects of poverty. They can't afford basic food and supplies, so they are criminalized when they are forced to take what they need. They have tried and tried to get out of poverty and find no real escape, so they take drugs and find an artificial one. Vermont is a rural state. Ohio is not. Nationally, rural areas are struggling to hold onto jobs and people. Akron is more than 20 times the size of Barrie. Only 21% of Ohio's population lives in rural areas, whereas in Vermont, 61% of the population does. In Vermont, this trend is hidden behind our low unemployment rate, which has hovered around 2 to 3% over the last few years. But we don't have low unemployment because there are a lot of jobs here. It's low because our workforce is shrinking. As of April 2018, The number of jobs in Vermont is only 2% higher than it was at the pre-recession peak. Meanwhile, the number of jobs nationally is 9% higher than its pre-recession peak. PBS NewsHour has found that the rural job market overall is 4% smaller than it was in 2008. Perhaps this is why many folks living in rural areas still feel like the recession hasn't ended for them. In 2016, Donald Trump channeled rural America's sense of hopelessness into anger and fear towards non-whites and urban elites. It is businessmen like Trump who have done the most damage. Caught in the relentlessly competitive system of capitalism, Trump and others like him are incentivized to squeeze out every bit of wealth for themselves and their shareholders, leaving towns like Barry desiccated, dry, crumbling. Then there are people like Sarah. People who despite being squeezed more and more each year, are nonetheless wellsprings of generosity and vision. Sarah has improved the lives of people in Barrie and beyond, working in, around, and outside of our social systems to help them escape poverty and a criminal justice system that penalizes it. Because of Sarah's generosity and vision for a more just society, we get to hear her story. I recorded Sarah's oral history in 2017. Here is Jenny performing Sarah's story. Barrie is one of the only cities in Vermont where people seem to be tied to history. The Canadian club is really big. There's still a handful of folks who speak French primarily, you know, like the worker center. Not the worker center, but the labor hall. Folks go there. And St. Monica's has a really old history feeling to it. I lived in Berlin two or three years, but none of it ever had the same kind of feeling. I grew up in Akron, Ohio, and I went to school in that area. We identify very much with cultural backgrounds in Northeast Ohio. The Midwest, in general, is very Polish. We're Polish. Not very Polish, but I spent a ton of time as a kid at the Polish American Club. Also, everybody is much more religious. Being raised Catholic was a huge part of my identity. 
The church that we went to was in Barberton, Ohio. Barberton was founded by O.C. Barber, and he was this matchstick maker. It's nowhere around anymore. He built these steeples and all this, and everybody came and they were working there. There's a little bit of rock work. I can't remember what it is. I think it's lime. There was also a little bit of rubber, because it's not far from Akron. It's a very working class kind of place. Akron also went through a horrible period of time. They were the rubber capital of the world. I don't even think they make tires in Akron anymore. Cleveland had the same kind of problem, and Pittsburgh, all around the same time. I went to a Catholic college, DePaul University, for my freshman year in Chicago. It was totally great, but I chose to transfer into Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, and that was amazing. Carnegie Mellon was really challenging. It was a very academic and intellectual environment. I wanted to be a teacher then, an elementary school teacher. And I was dissuaded from that by my advisor. One of the things my advisor said was, that's not what smart girls do. Why did you even bother coming here? Carnegie Mellon has got good rankings, blah, 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 and that it was a pretty stereotypical female job. At the time, I was like, Well, don't we want our best and brightest to be elementary school teachers? There's this perception that anyone can take care of small children. If I didn't have to worry about money, I would be a stay-at-home mom with six kids. That's something that seems like it's really out of the realm. Or I'd be a preschool teacher. I just love kids. I love them. I would rather be around little kids than anyone else. It's really important work, but daycares, preschools, that's like a welfare-to-work job. It's poverty-level wages. They're ridiculous. I can't afford to make that amount of money. My student loans, they stop me from doing nine out of ten things. Then, I don't know. I didn't know what I was going to do. I wasn't going to go to medical school because I just let it go away at some point as a senior maybe a freshman in college. So I was like, oh, well, I'll just go to law school. Like, hey, why not? Because that's what everyone said then. Oh, you can open so many doors. You can do so many different things with your law degree, which is a bunch of fooey. When I went to law school, things were on an upswing. When I graduated from law school was when it started to go down. Right now, my heart breaks for the kids that are graduating. The market has changed so much. It's really bad for them. There's software replacing them for a lot of different things. For entry-level folks, there aren't very many jobs out there that are paying big bucks. And definitely not in Vermont. They don't exist really at all. I came to this job because I was really burnt out on a more crisis-based work. Then, when I was practicing law, like at Community Action, I was at the Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency. I represented victims in civil legal proceedings, and I was on their 24-7 hotline. I have vivid memories of just leaving my winter coat on because they're cuddly, and I was eating nachos every night that I made at home. They're really nutritious, okay? It touches every food group. It's calmer at my new job, but they're expanding, and they want all cases, beside the most serious, to go through restorative justice regardless of the person's record. Technically, I should be getting every case unless it's one of the seven listed crimes, which are the really, really bad ones like rape and arson and stuff. The folks that we're seeing with these really long criminal histories and these high needs, they're all transient. They don't have telephones. They pop in and out. We have two programs. We have one that's like regular diversion, and it's for folks... Usually, they're younger, who made one mistake. They're going to meet with me one time, tell me their story, 
We're going to figure out what need they were meeting when they made those choices and come up with some other ways that they can meet it in the future. They meet with our diversion review panel to tell their story, take responsibility in public, also to come up with officially, how am I going to complete this process? How am I going to get these charges to be dismissed and to have my records sealed? Then there's another program called the Tamarack Program, which is for folks who have, for whatever reasons, state's attorneys identified them as having a mental health or substance abuse problem. And that's the reason that they continue to be involved in the criminal justice system. Those folks are agreeing to treatment, and we're going to come up with a plan together, and I do service coordination. No one day looks the same. I get to hear people's stories all day, every day. Some of the stuff is hilarious. Some of it's not. We're not a crisis program. I don't have food here. I don't really have any emergency assistance or anything like that. In general, people come in here and they're not in crisis. If they are in crisis, it's totally my job to get them to somebody who can handle it. Underage drinking and marijuana tickets, those are fun. It's a really brief intervention. They're all under 21. They're so cute. They're adorable. <laughs> then I've got some folks who have really, really bad addiction or really, really bad mental health. It's a struggle at this point to make it a part of our program and to make it so that we're able to handle that caseload. Last Monday, I don't know if it was the full moon or what, but I come to work and it's just shot out of a cannon. These people came in completely off the wall. I love that, but then I'm also like, whoa, I'm tired now. One of them, she was so high, just unbearably high. She's also sweet and hilarious. Comes into my office, she takes off her pants and passes out on the floor. Then, intermittently, she's talking to me. Part of the program is for me to get her into treatment, but relapse is a part of recovery. She needs a ride to the clinic, but then she's also drooling now. What are we supposed to do? I know what I would do over at the Domestic and Sexual Violence Agency, but now it's like this growing pain. My caseload is getting big. I'm getting a little bit anxious about it. I have close to 100 cases. We have a lot of retail thefts here. For example, unlawful trespasses up at Walmart. This person had a retail theft when they were 15, 18, or whatever. Now, time's gone by, and they're not supposed to be able to go back to Walmart. It's like, where else am I going to go? I'm now 25, and I need to buy diapers for my kid. I don't have transportation. It's ridiculous. I don't put a lot of my retail thefts that are based on poverty in front of the panel anymore. We, as a community, aren't participating in that circle. We can't have a truly restorative justice process because we've failed that person. This is a needs-based choice. She stole formula. I'm not going to have people write a freaking apology letter to Rite Aid or Walmart and say, oh, I'm so sorry that I'm poor. I'm working for you, and you're not paying me enough to meet my basic needs. No, it's not happening. I've just tried to move them into just having a conversation with me. Looking at ways to increase their income, advocate for themselves differently, I don't know. I hate that piece of it. I really, really hate it. I also hate this idea of an apology letter or a, a thank you note. That's such a white middle class value that's being projected on people. Vermont, I think, is one of the only states in the country, according to the last census, whose poverty level increased. We have more families living in poverty. I think that the factors, like the geography, the ruralness, you're like in a different world a little bit. If you can scrap metal or do really, really difficult, physically demanding stuff, I guess you can get a job where it pays well without much education or training. I don't know. It's not great. I don't think that Vermont's unique. The whole nation is not spending very much time nurturing our middle class. 
We hate poor people, too. Vermont's a little bit better, but I really think at the end of the day, we see it as a shortcoming. More and more of us are being pushed over that edge. We're dealing with things my parents had never had to conceive of, like student loans. Student loans are such a huge part of my life and the life choices that I've made. We're trying to start a resource room with coping mechanisms and books people can borrow and art things. I'm on the board of Safe Art in Chelsea, and we're going to try to have them come out here and do some stuff with art, just to build up the community side of the restorative justice model, because we're not great with that. We get the community involved for our panels, and that's it. It's a one-time touch. But that's not the point of it all. We're trying to expand that. There's this one little boy. He's not little. He's like 16, but he loves Harry Potter and he loves reading. He's here for serious violence, but he just, he just needs a mom. I've been bringing in books for him to read. I'm reading Harry Potter and he's like, we are going to have a movie thing because he can't believe that I haven't seen the movies. Like, oh my God, (laughs) that'll be fun. Right now, I'm really focused on getting back into practicing law. I really feel like I could be so much more effective. We don't do a great job of training attorneys. We don't have a residency type program for them. I think that most lawyers have no idea that you're going to work with human beings and people. Our public defense system here in Vermont is ridiculous. We contract out these firms and some of them are literally stealing from us. They're not doing their due diligence. They're not meeting their ethical requirements. And no one seems to care. Like, with kids and their parents, I know for a fact they're not going to see them at their house. They're not meeting them. They're meeting them five minutes before court. That is not acceptable. You need to be advocating for your client. The system is really involved here in a way that it's not in other places. It's somewhat paternalistic. Folks aren't meeting their needs, and they're spending all of their energy on that. They'll say to me, thanks for being nice to me. You listen to me. Thanks so much. You're the best. It's like, it really means so much to me, but at the same time, it also makes me want to cry. Because you really shouldn't be thanking me for treating you like a human being. We help people not because we want results. They're not an investment. They're human beings. We help people because we are part of a community. Our freedom, our liberation, our everything is tied up with each other, and you walk with each other. It's just what you do. My parents both volunteer a lot. My dad was a Vietnam veteran and had some pretty severe PTSD. I'd wake up and there'd be a homeless vet in our living room. He had this one vet friend who was a heroin addict. He would bring us around him and not really explain anything to us. It was just such a lesson in having compassion and empathy. He's a big guiding force in my life. He was never black and white when we were growing up. When he was 50, my grandmother's dying wish was for him to get better. She missed him. He promised her he would do it, and he stopped working, and he went to this PTSD 13-week program through the VA. He really immersed himself in this, and then he retired. It was really wonderful. A huge part of his healing, his growth, and his life was helping other people. The system is big and nebulous. They don't come out and say, oh, you're entitled to this. You're entitled to that. Actually, what you're feeling right now is PTSD. In the last five years of his life, he found Tears of a Warrior, a book, and he gave away over 3,000 copies to different people. He mailed me a copy shortly after he'd actually read it. In the book, it says... If only I'd known sooner. He passed two years ago. Hmm? 
after he passed, I have a bunch of Facebook friends at this point where I've never met them in my entire life. I have no idea who they are, but they're like, your dad helped me figure out what was going on with me. He helped me navigate these benefits. I have health insurance because of him. I'm working at the VA because of him. It was the same thing. They're like, I'm so sorry. I didn't know that he had passed, but you're like a sister to me now. It's really, it's just amazing. He taught me everything. I'm not officially a social worker, but that's, that's really what we do. Case managers, lawyers, really should be problem solvers. Continuing the work of my dad is my goal in everything. My parents have been retired now for, I guess, my mom's been retired for 18 years, and my dad was retired for 18 years before he passed. They have really rich lives. My dad volunteered, my mom volunteers. She's a fiber artist. She crochets, she knits, she does embroidery, and wins awards for it. She quilts, and she goes to church, and she has these really deep relationships. I feel like more of her life is meaningful. It would be awesome if we had four-day weeks. Every time I feel like three days is so much better to reset yourself. I'd like it if we started a little later. I just wish we didn't have to do it so much, that there weren't so many trappings. Because I don't think the purpose of us being on this earth is to work. I think we're just supposed to be here. Jennifer has worked a variety of jobs and was pursuing a graduate degree in medical ethics at the time of this recording. She understands the challenges and complexities of earning an education and pursuing work that feels meaningful and beneficial to society. I definitely feel like there are certain aspects of this individual's life that I can connect to. I really love the way that she kind of is so invested in making a positive influence in her community. And, you know, the job that she has is really important as far as actually making sure that, you know, kids have a safe place to go and getting people back on the right track, which we're not always that great about considering how to best get people back there. I also really enjoyed the way that she kind of draws strength from her family and like her life. When I graduated from my undergraduate degree, um, you know, try getting a real job with a four-year degree in religious, com you know, comparative religion. Like it just, there's not a lot of opportunity for that. Um, and so I actually ended up having to live with my parents as like a 30-year-old for a couple of years. Living at home and not paying rent. Like I think about single mothers who have to have a two or three bedroom house to like make space for their kids. And I'm like, how, how, how could they possibly do this? And you wonder how people end up on the streets. It's like, I was lucky. I had a support system fall back into. But these other people, there's no question of why you end up on the streets. I couldn't get a job where I could afford to pay rent and student loans. And even then, I got a job at a law office with a four-year degree that they required that I have. Do you think that my four-year degree has anything to do with what I do on a day-to-day -day basis? But I'm $100,000 in debt just so that I can get a job as a, like, entry-level position into a law firm where I'm not even using the degree, but I had to have it in order to be considered. The cost of education these days is just astronomical. It's kind of insane. It doesn't really make sense to me the way that you can have a school that, you know, 30 years ago was charging a fraction of the cost of what it costs today. And on top of that, you know, you've got hate to be one of those people, but like you've got these 
older generations that are saying that millennials are just lazy and that we're not doing the work. And it's like, yeah, but your house cost, you know, $20,000 when you had to purchase it. And now that same house costs 400000 and your schooling cost a grand a semester. And now it costs 20 grand a semester. And you're trying to say that it's laziness, but it's really just that the landscape has changed. But then I also think of, you know, the other spectrum of things like my boyfriend he didn't pay for college. He came from a very privileged household and he never had debt and he still doesn't have debt. And he can't possibly comprehend what it means to be in debt and how cyclical it is in the sense that like you have all this debt, you're trying to pay it off and then you have your car break down. So you have to put that on your credit card or take out a line of credit to pay for your car to get fixed, which is more debt, which is harder to pay off. And it just like builds and builds and builds. Like I'm only now in a place at this moment where I'm finally starting to pay down my debt because I'm in grad school and my student loans are on deferral. But as soon as I finish grad school, they're going to come back. I pray that I'm out of credit card debt, my car is paid off, like all of these things by the time I finish grad school, because as soon as those student loans kick back in, it's going to make up for all of the payments that I would have been making anyway. So you think working class, you think plumbers or you think the person who's ringing your groceries out at the grocery store or the person who's fixing your car and not a mechanic or serving you food at a restaurant like that's what you think but like in reality the scope is so much larger than that like my brother-in-law is a lawyer he's an attorney most people think of that as like the elite like white collar workers And hypothetically speaking, you know, yeah, obviously he wears like the white collar to go to work on a day-to-day basis, but he's still struggling financially to make ends meet for him and my sister who's a nurse and they have three kids. And it's like people automatically assume that there's like this elite group of people who make all of the money and have all of the wealth. And it's not that there's not those people, but there's like this variation depending on where you are and where you are in your career and where you are in the world. I agree with her. I think that there's only so much you can do in a broken system. I mean, you can try to get somebody on the right track. You can try to find them a better job situation or a better living situation. But like the bottom line is, is that if we aren't doing more to help the community break out of that cycle, then A, there's always going to need be somebody that needs help. And B, what happens if the job that you got her, the company folds for whatever reason? What happens if she has an emergency situation where she needs to be out of work for a month or two and the job has to go to somebody else and then she all of a sudden doesn't have a place to come back to? You have to think about how to make it more accessible for people on all levels, on all echelons, and it's something that in a capitalistic society like the one that we live in, people are so concerned about what they can bring into their own lives and they don't take the bigger picture And that's kind of one of the things that, like, for me with medical ethics that I kind of always am trying to say whenever, you know, and a lot of people that I work with in ethics understand this, but a lot of people in medicine don't. A patient is more than just the sum of the symptoms or the diseases that they might have. A patient has a very, very, very complicated background. They have family history. They have a community that they're a part of. They have socioeconomic background differences. They have all of these things that make them who they are, that weigh into how they're going to make their decisions about whether or not a treatment might be right for them or wrong for them because of their situation. Like, do they live alone? Are you talking about giving them a highly invasive surgery that has a six-month recovery period? Like, who's going to take care of them? Like, you have to take all of these things into consideration when thinking about what is best for the patient. And a lot of people don't really want to take the time to do that. That's a problem that I have. Sarah probably sees that all the time with people who want a quick fix. They want a quick answer, you know, restorative justice, you know, diversion programs. Let's just stick them here and they'll be better in a month. It's like, it's not that simple because they get out of whatever program that they're in and they go back home. And that's when most people relapse. That's when most people fall back into the same situation. It's not when they're in rehab. It's not when they're getting counseling. It's when they go home and they have to return to their day-to-day lives and try to figure out how to make life work as this person who doesn't do drugs anymore, even though they still have the same friends and the same family, or 
doesn't steal to get what they need because that's the way that they've always had to do it because they don't have access to anything else. Like that's why it doesn't work is because you're not fixing the root problem, you're fixing the symptom. Maybe we can find the courage to get at the root of social problems. The root is capitalism, which treats all of the things we need to live healthy and dignified lives as commodities and not as human rights. Things like food, housing, healthcare, education, culture, clean water, and air. We all deserve these things, regardless of whether there is someone willing to hire us. Our purpose is deeper than the ones determined by our employers. Because, as Sarah said, I don't think the purpose of us being on this earth is to work. I think we're just supposed to be here. How has your town been affected by economic change? Have jobs and industries left, or are they in the process of leaving? How are your neighbors getting by? How are you getting by? Do you have student debt? Did you relate to Sarah's story? Let's keep the conversation going. You can post your stories on our Facebook page, send us a tweet at Podcast or email us at onmasspodcast at gmail.com. That's E-N-M-A-S-S-E podcast. For the next episode, we will go back in time to the Great Depression. The Depression marked a time of unprecedented job loss in the United States. While a devastating 8.8 million people lost their jobs in the Great Recession, the record still stands at 13 million jobs lost in the Great Depression. And while the social safety net is weak in the United States, it was practically non-existent during the Depression. We will hear the story of an umbrella repairman named Pat, who not only had to face the Depression, but also addiction, specifically alcoholism. He may have ended up in Sarah's office, were such social services available during the Depression. Thank you for listening. We have additional reading materials, archive footage, and show notes on our website. While there, you can give us feedback or suggestions, including ones for the next season. This is an independently produced show. I receive support from you, my listeners. If you like this show, go to onmasspodcast.com slash donate to show your support. Special thanks to Sarah and Jennifer for this episode. The song, John Henry, at the beginning of our show is from the Alan Lomax Collection at the American Folklife Center, Library of Congress, used courtesy of the Association for Cultural Equity. I'm Liz Medina. This is On Mass, bringing you stories of struggle and hope from the working class.